Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For He commanded, and they were created. He established them forever and ever and fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together let them praise the name of the lord for his name alone is exalted his glory is above the earth and the heaven he has raised up a horn for his people praise for all his faithful for the people of israel who are close to him praise the lord this is the word of the lord thanks be to god So there's a lot going on in today's story about Simeon and Anna, and Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and of God's promise of salvation. Now I'm not going to cover all of them. This morning we're just going to take a look at three particular aspects of the story. The first one, when old meets new. The second one, everyday rituals. And the third one, promises. Lately, I've been hearing, and maybe you have too, people saying things like, I've done my time. Perhaps you have even uttered similar words as these. It's time for someone else to do what I've been doing all these years. It's time for that younger generation to take up the job. <coughs> I don't always really know what they're referring to, but it could be that they have been on worship committee for like over 30 years. <laughs> more candle holders than the person can count, and scraped more Christmas candle wax from underneath the pews that they can open their own candle shop. <coughs> Maybe they have taught confirmation in Sunday school classes since their kids were young, and now their grandchildren, and maybe even their great-grandchildren are at that age, and they have decided enough is enough, that they've earned their stripes. And they deserve to kick back and relax a little. Maybe they've served on an ever-faithful property committee for more than 50 years, and they have been the chairperson twice, or maybe even three times. It's so long they can't even remember. They have changed every light bulb in the building countless times, and they've even mowed the lawn. If they've done it once, they've done it a hundred times, even in that crazy heat. Another thing I hear a lot is, we need to bring in those young families. I'm too old to be doing this anymore. With the expectation that those families will take up the mantle where the elders, the I've put in my time folks, have left off. Or maybe they're making ready to do so. But look at the Bible, and the Bible gives us a different picture of what it is to be an elder in this life with God. I mean, Noah was like 500 years old or something when God said, build the ark. <laughs> Moses, and he was 80, and his brother Aaron was like 83 when they were called to go back and speak to Pharaoh. And remember that after that, they wandered around in the desert for like 40 more years, making them like 120. <laughs> Abraham was about 100, and Sarah was, some people say, in her 90s when they had their son Isaac. And Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, is even described as having been along in years when she conceived. An American poet and author of such poems as Paul Revere's Ride, his name was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, he once said, Age is opportunity, no less than youth itself, though in another 
dress. So on one hand, we have the old or the past or the elder or whatever you want to classify. But on the other one, in my old meets new analogy, is the new and the young. If not young in chronological age, at least young in heart or new to faith. And from these new young voices, I have heard things also like, I cannot believe that they have to do it that way all the time because they've always done it. <laughs> Isn't that just a little old fashioned? Why can't we just do it our way? And I wish we could just get them up to speed on this new modern music and stuff. Jeez, I mean, gosh. The young and the new come from fresh ideas and fresh energy, and they may see things in a whole new way. Ways that could be good to examine. Ways that we have been around long enough to be afraid to explore. The young and the new bring excitement and fervor and ruffle the feathers of the old geese, making it uncomfortable sometimes but also allowing for some of the dust to sort of be disturbed. A few years ago, I found myself in one of these old meets new situations. Pastor Tom, who was usually up here on Sunday mornings, and I, we met for coffee, talking about that path to ordination I mentioned earlier. I was about to embark on a four-year journey that would include seminary and internships and many ministry opportunities but also lots and lots of books and lots of reading and lots of writing. But I was excited. So excited, in fact, that I told him that I wish I could just jump to the end, like bypass all that book stuff, get there tomorrow morning, forget all that schooling stuff, and be a minister today. I was full of get up and go. But... I am happy to say that a wiser voice, in this case, Pastor Tom, was there to help guide me and my excitement down the right path. Tom and I are almost exactly the same age, but he is many years wiser than me in ministry experience. He smiled, and if I remember right, he even laughed a little bit, but he applauded my enthusiasm as the younger and did not squelch it. But he reminded me how important this part of the journey ahead of me was in preparing me to do the job that I was eventually going to do. And it's four years hence, and I am grateful for the mentorship that he provided me. I now see and have experienced in practical ways the value of everything that I had to do and I'm still doing. Alexander McLaren, in his Expositions of Holy Scripture, writes, The relation of the new to the old is one that recurs in every generation. It is well for the new when it consents to be taken up in the arms of the old. And it is ill of the old when, instead of welcoming, it frowns on the new. And instead of playing the part of Simeon and embracing the blessing of the infant, plays the part of Herod and seeks to destroy the child that seems to threaten its sovereignty. We old, who are conservative in nature by years, and you young people who are revolutionary and innovating by reason of your youth, may both find a lesson in that particular picture in the temple of Simeon with the infant child in his arms. So number one, when old means new. Number two in this story is there were some everyday rituals happening. For example, in your own life, have you ever been driving down the road somewhere and you're like, I'm on my way to wherever it is, and halfway there you realize you are halfway to the wrong place. It's happening. It is habit. It is ritual that we do every single day without even thinking of it. How many have trained yourself to play an instrument? Maybe sing, maybe crochet, maybe do some woodworking. It takes practice. It takes habit. It takes an everyday stick to itiveness. It's something that when it's not there, we tend to like miss it. We feel like something is just not right. It's that everyday normal 
ritual practice. When we meet Simeon and Anna, we read about their practices. We find them as they are going about their daily ritual activities. Simeon visited the temple, I think just about every day, and Anna rarely even left the temple, staying there instead, praying and fasting without ceasing. They were doing their normal, everyday things. When Joseph and Mary arrived, they found Simeon and Anna in the midst of this every day. There wasn't some special sign like the Christmas light in the sky on Christmas Eve we always see over the nativity. No angels came telling them that morning that salvation is on its way today in the form of a baby. It didn't happen that way. They were doing the things that pious Jews did on a regular basis. They were worshiping the Lord every day in all that they did. And salvation came to them in the midst of that ordinary day. And Mary and Joseph were following the law and doing what it was that pious Jews did also. They had already had Jesus circumcised and named on the eighth day and had returned to the temple to complete the purification rites required of them by the law of Moses. They came to offer the sacrifice to the Lord. They were doing everyday stuff. The world that we live in sometimes is so full of distraction that it is difficult for us to see God in the midst of it. We are bombarded with advertisements, social media, and TV shows telling us how things don't matter unless they're big and flashy and garner a lot of attention for us, usually. Little value is given to the tiny, everyday things around us. Wonder has given way to wow. And we can't seem to see the beauty of a teeny tiny little wild strawberry down hidden in the grass because we're too busy trying to make the whole yard weed free and perfectly cut. Salvation came to Simeon and Anna in the midst of the teeny tiny, the little and somewhat mundane of everyday rituals of first century life. Simeon saw salvation in the flesh and embraced it. And God comes to us just like that, too, in everyday things that we do. The regular places we go, the ordinary people that we meet and interact with. There doesn't need to be some big spiritual awakening, fireworks going off, and music playing, fantastical experience for God to work. We can find God, find salvation, see Jesus in, around, above, and below, in all that we say all that we experience. Salvation has come and is in the midst of the everyday ritual. So old meets new and everyday rituals. The third thing is promises. At certain times of the year, as Lori was telling our kids this morning, usually around um, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, around Christmas and Easter, the networks play a fan favorite. Jill Brenner and Charlton Heston. It's a Ten Commandments movie. And one of the scenes was about to punish the Israelites, restricting their straw supply for making bricks. Pharaoh commands, saying, So let it be written, so let it be done. And following through on his promise, he sent orders for this command to his overseers to make sure that it was carried out. When I was a kid, I sometimes heard my parents say the words, because I said so. This usually followed my complaining as to why I had to do something or why I wasn't allowed to do something. And once the words, because I said so, were spoken, I knew it was over. Whatever my parents had decided was final. It was definitely not going to play out the way I wanted but the way they said so, and nothing I could do was going to change that position. Last week, I stumbled upon an advertisement for a book and a website named Because I Said I Would. Because I Said I Would, as described on their website, is a social movement 
dedicated to the betterment of humanity through promises made and kept. They say that a lot of people don't keep their promises. And they claim that their programs bridge the gap between intention, what we say we're going to do, and action, what we actually follow through and do. A movement like this is only possible because we as imperfect human <clears throat> beings make mistakes even when we have the best intentions. We don't always keep our promises. We make and break promises all the time. As a matter of fact, in a couple of days, we are going to make some promises that we call resolutions. In other words, promises to us. But research shows that within a few weeks, if not even a few days, most of those resolutions and um, promises to ourselves are going to be broken. But here's the good news. In fact, it's the great news. is that God is not like us. But more like Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments Pharaoh following through on God's promise. And maybe more like my parents' parenting style, because I said so, or the nonprofit movement, because I said I would, says God. God follows through on her promises because she said she would. That is who God is. Always faithful, always following through to do. But she said she would do. A number of years ago, there was a reality television show hosted by a fellow named Ty Pennington. It's called Extreme Makeover Home Edition. In the show, we'd be introduced to a family who was in need of a remodel due to a hardship situation. He would ship them off for a few weeks, Disney World usually. Near the end of the program, though, the family would come back. The cameras would all be there, and the neighbors, and maybe even a marching band. And the family would be standing across the street, and in front of them would be this big bus. The family would be blindfolded and be hidden behind this bus. They could only remember their old house. At some point, Ty Pennington would yell, who knows it, Driver, move that bus! And the family would be in awe as they saw what had happened while they were gone. I think that this is how we are sometimes. We can't believe it until we see it. Simeon had been told by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he saw salvation. And he believed it all those years. Every day he arrived at the temple knowing that someday he would lay his eyes on God's promise of salvation, whatever form it would take. He didn't know that it would be a baby boy who would someday hang on the cross. He didn't know when he would get to see the promise of salvation, but he believed. And on that day, amidst the mundane, everyday routines of an old man and an old woman, God kept her promise, and salvation came to Simeon Anna in the form of a newborn baby boy, Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of the world. On this first Sunday after Christmas, salvation has come to you. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your spiritual life, whatever is there, let salvation come. Let Christ come in. Open your heart. And let Christmas come find you.